Hi and welcome. My name is Bob Dibner, Senior Applications Engineer at Corellis. In this presentation, I'll be providing a technical introduction to the IEEE 1149.1 standard, often referred to as JTAG, including the basics of the architecture, requirements, and how this standard can be leveraged to access embedded test functionality using supported components. Uh, we do have some requirements. So we have test requirements. Uh, this is a DFT, Design for Testability type, um, thing that we're using here. Uh, we need to be able to have this capability designed into the system to use it. Uh, the good news is many components implement this standard, uh, especially your higher pin count devices. Your C CPUs, FPGAs, uh, some memory standards will implement it, some because they have to. It's part of the memory standard to have this capability. Uh, some of your more complex FIs may implement this, things like network chips. Excuse me. Uh, DSPs, especially the kind that may have an integrated processor, uh, tend to integrate this uh, capability. And many vendors have been implementing this for a long time. It's a, it's a mature system. They're, they've gotten good at it at this point, and they are putting it in the newest chips as well. Uh, so for example, if you have a Xilinx FPGA, it is going to have this capability. Uh, many Intel processors we've worked with. Uh, if we do have these devices available to us, ideally we want to daisy chain them so that we can use one connector to communicate with all of them. Uh, we do want to be able to communicate with all chips at the same time because we want to test for interconnect problems between them. So for example, if U1 and U12 have interconnects, we want to be able to tell U1 as a device drive a signal and U12 as a device, receive that signal and tell me that you got the signal that was expected. Uh, if we can't do that, then we can't get full testability. Um, and I do wanna mention we are only going to talk about that at like an application level or like how we use it. Um, we won't go into any details on the architecture of it. So for the boundary scan capability, we want to be able to talk to all of these devices at once. Um, if you do need to break them into multiple chains, that's okay. Uh, question, what does it mean by U1 to U12? Um, I can use this diagram, it's, it's the same. Um, so in this case, U1 and U2 are devices. These are uh, chips on a board. They are connected together. Their TDO of U1 goes to TDI of U2, and then TDO of U2 goes back to a connector. Uh, these can be all on one chain, or you can break them up. You can have multiple daisy-chained devices coming to different connectors. Uh, it may be common to, for example, put a CPU on its own connector uh, so that your embedded software guys can just connect to that, use their JTAG tools for debugging that CPU. Uh, if you do break these out into multiple chains, that's okay. Uh, for us, we have hardware that will uh, connect them together. Uh, you just plug each uh, connector into a different tap on our JTAG controller. Uh, you can combine them using cables or fixtures. We recommend against it. Uh, we found that using cables and uh, passive uh, solutions tend to uh, have signal integrity problems. Uh, BSDL stands for Boundary Scan Description Language. This is part of the IEEE 1149.1 standard. It tells us uh, what these devices do, what their capability is. It describes their boundary scan register, tells us uh, what cells are in what order, how they connect to the pins. Uh, this was originally based on BHDL, but at some point uh, during standards updates, I believe they made the comment that it no longer has to um, follow the BHDL rules. A BSDL is a device model. It's what we load into our software to help us generate test patterns. It tells us everything we need to know about that device. We get these from the chip manufacturers. Uh, if you're doing chips in-house or maybe with a contract uh, ASIC uh, designer, you would get those from them. Uh, otherwise, for example, I, I, I like to use Xilinx as a, um, my example for most of these things. You go to the Xilinx website, uh, you register, you agree to the export statement, you can download BSDLs from them. Unfortunately, due to some of the restrictions, uh, we do not provide these BSDLs directly, uh, but we can help you find them. If you're looking for a model for a device, um, let us know. We have some experience. 
Um, in some cases, you may have to go to um, like an, uh, an applications engineer, an FAE at the company that makes that chip and ask them if they can help you find it. Uh, this file does describe pin names and pin types. It's going to tell us uh, which pins we have control over. It's going to tell us how our boundary scan capability maps to physical pin numbers. It's going to tell us which pins are our JTAG signals. It's going to describe compliance conditions. So the compliance condition would be a signal that needs to be set in a particular state for this boundary scan capability to happen. You can think of it often, it, it might be like a, a test enable type signal that says, set this high to put it in test mode, set it low to take it out of test mode. Uh, it's going to describe the instruction register length, which I did mention is variable, uh, and the opcodes available to us, boundary scan register sequence, and um, what those cells do. Uh, one line I skipped there, uh, you may have multiple BSDLs for one chip. So what that could mean is it may be um, like a multi-chip module. It could be um, multi-core where you have uh, multiple logical taps inside the device uh, and we need to be able to talk to each of those. Uh, you can also have a BSDL for a device that changes its behavior uh, depending on whether it's configured or not. So common example is an FPGA. When I configure an FPGA, what used to be all bi-directional signals is now a set of inputs and a set of outputs, and some still bi-directional, uh, but it does change its behavior, so we need a new BSDL to describe that. Excuse me. Uh, you need a netlist to describe how chips interconnect. Um, in the case of our software, we can convert many formats. Uh, our preference is the Telesys format. It's very simple and it's our native format, but if you have something else, we can usually convert it. Uh, so as far as netlists, um, if you do have a netlist that does not meet our format uh, or something that we've already uh, converted, then we have some other tools internal to us and there's some third party tools out there. Uh, and uh, so question, the netlist here, this is a netlist for the entire board assembly. So the PCBA uh, netlist. If you want to do internal chip tests, uh, or like maybe uh, we have some customers who have multi-chip modules where there's gonna be multiple die within a package, then it would be the package level netlist. But for board assembly testing, uh, it needs to be a netlist for the board. If you're doing system level test, it would be a netlist for the system, uh, which often we do individual PCBAs and then merge them together uh, using the Scan Express merge tool that we'll talk about on the last session. Uh, so we have JTAG hardware that is going to connect to a system for controlling it. Uh, we have single tap, four tap, eight tap. Um, in some of our older controllers, we also have 32 tap uh, capability. Uh, we have multiple interfaces. The one that we see here is uh, dual interface USB and, and gigabit ethernet. Uh, but we can meet a lot of requirements. Uh, when you do create test vectors with our Scan Express TPG software, they can be run on any controller without modifying them. There are some advanced features in the controllers that you can utilize, uh, but those are in addition to the standard test vectors that we generate. Uh, and we do support some third-party hardware. For example, uh, Blackhawk is our sister company. They make uh, JTAG controllers for Texas Instruments uh, DSPs. We can use those. Uh, we did an integration with National Instruments uh, using their uh, 65XX HSDIO series. Uh, Freescale's Code Warrior TAP uh, we used. Um, FTDI makes some USB to serial transceivers that have JTAG capability. We can use those. Uh, and with Teradyne, we've done both uh, DI series and HS sub. Uh, for using their hardware, and we also have integration cards for some ICT systems and ATE systems. Uh, our software is Windows-based. Uh, we've found that pretty much all the manufacturing seems to run on uh, Windows, at least at the instrument level. So we support Windows uh, 7, 8, and 10. Uh, it, most of our software will probably still run on Windows XP. We just don't uh, actively test it because it no longer um, fits our development platform. Uh, we no longer have tools to test it. Uh, we have had customers run on Mac OS using Parallels and Linux uh, using Wine. 
Uh, if you are doing that, you will need to use a network-based controller and a network-based license for your software uh, because we don't have native drivers that, uh, that uh, communicate with our software on those systems. Uh, so once we have software running, uh, you can download it uh, digitally if you want to get our software. Um, load that onto your host PC. A host PC connects to the JTAG controller and JTAG controller through some um, ribbon cable or fixturing connects to the UUT or your target board. Uh, in this case, it looks like an older Stratix development board. And that's how you make your connection. And this system would be what you put on a production line. Uh, it's also, for example, what you might use on your desktop for debugging. Uh, so really, you can use the same system for debug. Um, we do have integration cards if you want to deploy to um, a more polished system. But otherwise, it's all benchtop or desktop type um, instruments. All right, I've used this term uh, multiple times. Uh, but now we're going to talk a little bit more about it. The test access port or TAP. The TAP is defined by the standard. Uh, we have expanded on it. So the 1149.1 standard defined T reset, TDI, TDO, TMS, and TCK signals. Uh, for our hardware, we like to add extra features. We have three GPIOs uh, that can also be repurposed for uh, SPI signaling, so SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. Uh, they can be used for right strobe, which we'll talk about when we get into DFT. Uh, we can do voltage sense on pins 17 and 19 of many of our controllers. Uh, but one thing to know, these first 10 pins on all Corellis JTAG controllers will always be the same. Uh, those are meant to be um, reusable. You can go from one JTAG controller to another if you only use those pins. If you do some of the more advanced stuff, you may have to use certain Corellis uh, JTAG controllers. Uh, there is no standard for pinout from uh, the 1149.1 standard. So Corellis, we have our own pinout. Uh, we have a 10, a 16, and a 20 pin tap. In this case, we're looking at a 20 pin version. Uh, but there are many pinouts out there. Uh, for example, uh, Texas Instruments uses uh, many different uh, taps at this point. Um, uh, Altera uses, or uh, Intel FPGA uses maybe one or two. Uh, Xilinx has one or two. So each of the vendors, um, they have some that they recommend based on their hardware, but they're all different. There's no standard. There's no one standard. We like our standard because we pair every signal with a ground. We find this makes for good signal integrity. Um, we do have some recommendations for uh, termination. Recommend 1K pull-ups on your uh, output from the JTAG controller input to the UUT. So we recommend that you put pull-ups on the board. Um, and the value there, we say 1K, that's good enough for most, uh, but it's not necessarily 1K. I mean, you could, if you can simulate, uh, you might be able to come up with a more appropriate value or you may empirically determine a better pull-up value. Uh, so here's something similar that's uh, shown in schematic format. So for example, you would implement this tap connector on your board if you wanted it to be a one-to-one -one connection with uh, Corellis uh, hardware. And that would connect you to your boundary scan devices. So T reset, TMS and TCK goes through all boundary scan devices. Uh, TDO comes from the last device, TDI goes to the first device. And then those are of course chained together uh, again, these 1K values are uh, just a recommendation for a starting point. Uh, if you can improve it, improve it. Uh, so I have a question, why are pull-ups required? Uh, so for signal integrity purposes, we want to terminate all signals. Uh, our controllers will tend to have, um, I believe, uh, some of them will have pull-ups uh, on the signal on our end, but then you need to terminate that on the other end uh, to prevent things like ringing. Uh, I am not a signal integrity expert. Uh, it is often black magic to me, uh, but my understanding is you want to terminate your um, output from the controller input to the UUT uh, with pull-ups and output from the device to the controller with a series uh, low impedance resistor of 33 ohms or similar. Uh, if your device um, data sheet recommends something else, so for example, uh, maybe it says you should pull down the clock 
then put a pull down there. Uh, if you have the board real estate, you can always put a footprint for both pull up and pull down so that it can be uh, changed later. Uh, but we do recommend during design, uh, make sure that you have a footprint for a pull up for termination. Uh, if you don't, uh, you're running the risk of having bad signal integrity problems. And again, uh, I'm not a signal integrity person. Uh, so I, much of this I am actually just parroting here. Test capabilities. Uh, what can we do with this? So we can do, first of all, scan chain verification. Uh, what does that mean? That means we can read the ID of a device. Uh, we can give it instructions. We can make sure that the instruction register uh, propagates through all devices. So for example, uh, when we do a capture instruction in the IR capture state, that's going to allow us to read the instruction register capture value from all of the devices on the chain. If we do not get that value, for example, if it comes back all high or all low, that could indicate a problem with our scan chain where we have a break in the chain or a device is not operating correctly. Uh, device interconnections. So scan chain verification, uh, actually let me finish that one first. Uh, I mentioned IR capture that we can look for uh, breaks in the chain. Uh, we can read out device IDs. Uh, for example, an FPGA is likely going to have a device ID that tells us the manufacturer part number and revision. Uh, if that is a mismatch, if we got the wrong revision, we got the wrong FPGA part number, uh, that would fail scan chain verification and tell us wrong device populated. Uh, device interconnects, if we're looking for open and short faults, so that is our interconnect test and our bus wire test. The interconnect test is going to pick a direction for all drivers, um, for each driver in the system. So for example, if you have a bi-directional uh, pin, it is going to fix that in one state, either as input or output, uh, and it's going to run those Wagner type test patterns. We're looking for open and short faults. Uh, we have a second test that's related to that, the bus wire test, that instead of fixing the direction, it's going to turn on each driver in sequence. It's going to, for example, if you have three uh, bi-directional pins connected on one net, so they're all connected together, we will turn on driver number one and tell the other two drivers turn off and use your input capability. And then we'll go to number two and do the same. We'll turn on driver number two and turn off driver one and three. And then finally driver three will turn on and we'll turn off drivers one and two. That's the bus wire test. So that is going to test uh, nets that have multiple boundary scan pins on them. Uh, we can also test for resistor population. If you have pull up and pull down resistors, uh, we will drive against the pull value. So for example, pull up, we will drive that signal low. Uh, we will tri-state the boundary scan pin. We will expect that pull up to pull that signal high. We will sample it once more to make sure that it did pull it high. So we are looking for uh, shorts and opens on pull up and pull down resistors. Also, if you have a series resistor, uh, we can test through it. If you have a signal that's gonna go through, for example, low impedance resistor, we can drive one side of that resistor and we'll expect that value to come out the other side of that resistor. And I'll, I'll have some uh, Sorry, more details I'm on that. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, I triggered my uh, Apple Watch. Sorry about that. Uh, resistor testing and then memory testing. We can do memory testing. It's a pin level test where we can uh, send patterns into memory devices. Uh, we are essentially going to write to the memory and read from it. In doing so, we are verifying um, basic functionality where uh, it's at least powered up and responding to commands. And we are also looking for defects uh, on the control address and data buses where we might have a short or open fault uh, that happened during assembly. Uh, so a question here, how resistor test is done. Uh, so again, we are going to, and, and I want to mention this is a logic only test. We are not going to read the resistor value or anything like that. We only are going to determine presence. Uh, so we are going to drive against the value. So if you think of a resistor that is a pull-up resistor, we will drive that signal low. Uh, current will flow through that pull-up. We are going to tri-state the signal. So now we, our output signal is in uh, high Z mode. And then that pull-up is going to pull that signal up. Uh, that we expect now that signal to be at a one state, a logic high. We sample it once more and we read the high value. If we don't read the high value, then that is a test failure. 
Uh, so similar to what we do with the memory test, uh, we can do flash test and in-system programming where we are going to send commands to the flash device uh, to program it. So the difference between memory, well, or at least in our convention, memory tends to mean uh, volatile. Flash is non-volatile memory. In the case of memory, it's uh, ephemeral. We're going to send patterns in. We're going to get patterns out. and We don't care what happens to that device afterward. In the case of flash, we can send patterns uh, to program data into the flash. Uh, so we can do LED testing where we use this pin control to turn on an LED to illuminate an LED. Uh, and then you can either have, uh, for example, a test operator ensure that it is um, illuminated or maybe you have some instruments that you can use for that. Uh, cluster tests would be custom low speed tests. We also have a scripting language for creating functional type tests for peripheral tests. Uh, and again, this is all at low speed. CPLD and FPGA programming that is done using files from, excuse me, the CPLD or FPGA vendors software. For example, um, Xilinx Bivato software, excuse me, will generate a file that we can use to program a bitstream into an FPGA or into that FPGA's um, non volatile configuration device. Uh, and finally, functional tests using a CPU. We can do with uh, what we call the JET system. We'll talk about that later. Um, and to expand on this cluster concept, um, I'm going to have some slides later uh, to go over that. But that just generally, when I say cluster test, I'm talking about using a boundary scan device to test a non boundary scan device that is connected to it.